So with the new year, um, typically uh, what I've been trying to do the last couple of years is with the new year, try to uh, focus on something that we as a church can be uh, working towards together. Um, last year, I believe, if I remember correctly, it was focusing on God's word, reading it, uh, applying it, all those things. Um, and so with this being 2024, uh, I'm tasking myself with the same thing, uh, creating some sort of vision uh, for our church in 2024. Um, and, and the reason for that is, is for example, I'm a goals-oriented person. If I don't know where I'm going or why I'm going, um, I don't really get the point of things and I don't continue on with them. Um, I'll, I'll like working out. Uh, unless I have a goal in going to the gym, there's a lot of other things I would rather do than go to the gym, especially at six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Regardless if it's just good for me, I, there needs to be a goal. And so with our church, I think it can be the same way. Um, there's a, unless there's a goal or a vision, we can get lost in the why of things. We can start doing a lot of good stuff, but maybe miss out on, on taking part in the great things uh, in this town. And so that's what we're going to do today. We, what is the goal or vision? What should we be striving for in 2024? Now, to be clear, the mission has not changed. Okay, so with what we're going to talk about, the mission has not changed. Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the mission is to make disciples. Is to be a disciple, is to make a disciple. And that is something that's easy to forget, uh, even when, when we start talking about what we're going to talk about today. Um, I was reading a book that pointed this out last year. Um, a lot of times, the way we functionally live our lives is we would think that this uh, mission is go, therefore, and have more church members. Or go, therefore, and have a greater budget by the end of the year. Or have more people at Sunday service or Bible studies. But the mission is to be and make disciples. Now, the question is, <clears throat> what is a disciple? And just so we're all on the same page of what a disciple is, to just put a, a, an easy definition to it, Matthew 4, 19. A disciple is someone that obeys Jesus, is changed by Jesus, and is also bought into the mission of making disciples themselves. What we discuss today should not be at the expense of the mission. And so as you go to work, school, even going to church, how can you uh, find your part in this mission? Is there someone that you need to be investing in or do you need to be invested in? Because this is a command from our Lord who we talked about last week is God sitting on that throne. A good way to gauge it is if, uh, let's say I put someone in front of you, new Christian, new convert, and I say, teach them all the things that they need to know to obey Christ. Would you be able to do that? If not, I'd like to point you to a couple of things. One, continue coming to service. But there's also Bible studies. Those are great ways to learn the Bible, learn what it looks like to follow Jesus, um, and really just grow with other people. But another thing that you could consider is meeting with someone one-on-one. -on -one. That was something that I found super beneficial personally. Do what you need to do in order to take part in this mission, which is non-negotiable for those that say that Jesus is God and King and Lord of their lives. But if you do think you know what, what it would take to make a disciple, the question is then, who is that one person you could invest in over this next year? It might be a new year. We might be seeking to be a, a new us, but the mission is not new. And so the mission should not come at expense of, 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 to what we're talking about today. But as for what else to focus on, uh, we will be in John chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and grab them and turn there. Uh, we're just moving around a little bit. We will be in John chapter 6 next week. Um, but there are multiple reasons that I picked John as the gospel series that we're going through for this year. Um, chapter 13 being one of those reasons. And so, even talking about the mission, <clears throat> I think at times we focus so 
much on the mission. How are we going to share the gospel? How are we going to make disciples that we start to forget how to be the church? We hear everything around those things, sharing the gospel, Bible studies, and what ends up happening is so many people get burnt out or they feel lonely or they let distractions come in because what ends up, the feelings that end up happening is, oh, well, we have this mission, but it's not fulfilling. So there's discouragement. The church, I'm supposed to do that, but there's, it's not a source of joy or gladness. And that should not be the case, according to Jesus. See, the defining aspect of the church should not necessarily be a service or a Bible study or not even the mission, according to John chapter 13. Again, not at the expense of those things. Jesus commands to gather. He commands, obviously, to go and make disciples. But in chapter 13, what Jesus says is the defining characteristic of this community that we're a part of is sacrificial love for one another. In fact, it, it, it's so defining that Jesus goes so far as to say is, if you don't have it, or if you do, that is an evidence as to whether or not you are truly saved. And if I was to poll people in here, I think that is a characteristic that most would agree in that our church could grow in in 2024. Not to say no one's loving or this isn't a loving church. But again, there's loneliness in this church. There's burdens that people have or are experiencing alone. And if we're honest, the last thing we want to do is show up on a, on a Sunday or interact with one another. There's distractions we would much rather spend our time on. And if Jesus says this is a defining characteristic, that should make us pay attention to what he has to say today. And so let's look at what Jesus really means by loving one another. We'll be looking at most of chapter 13, but we're actually going to start in verse 31. And so uh, let me pray, and then we will look at this together. Uh, Father, I just pray for this time in your word. Uh, I pray that as we look to, to what it looks like, uh, to love one another in this year. Uh, I pray that, that you convict us, that you give us clarity on what that looks like practically, and that we uh, glorify you and, and honor you uh, accordingly. And I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. So since we're skipping ahead a little bit, uh, where we're at right now is, this, is the night that Jesus will be betrayed. Okay? So he just initiated the Lord's Supper, and Judas... He just left the group to go and betray Jesus. And that's why, starting in verse 31, it starts off with saying, Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And so Jesus, he brings attention uh, to attention that he is about to leave them. Okay, so verse 31, it says, Now is the Son of Man glorified. What Jesus is speaking to in that instance is what is about to happen. He's about to go to the cross. He's going to be beaten. He's going to die. But then he's going to come back to life. Proving who he is. He's fully God. We haven't looked at it, but he is the resurrection and the life but also that all these promises that he talks about, whether it's eternal life, a relationship with God, most people can make claims, but no one else can die and come back to life. Jesus did that so you can trust his promises. 
And so he's doing this for the sins of his people. He's reconciling people by his sacrifice through faith in him. And so this is what the Son of Man will go through. We talked about Son of Man a little bit last week. This is from Daniel 7. This isn't just a person that Jesus is referring himself to. This is the God King that is going to go through this. Again, we we talked about to some extent, like in Isaiah chapter 6, that is not God the Father. That is Jesus sitting on that throne in Isaiah 6, who's above everyone, lofty, and and, uh, his robe filling the entire temple. Jesus himself claims to be God. He's doing that here, and he's showing that God himself will be going through the greatest humility to reconcile sinners. Philippians 2, 5 5 through 11 says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And so Jesus, being fully God, set aside his rights as God to be tempted in every way we are, to live a sinful life still, and to become human, suffering and dying so that we can have a relationship with God. And why would Jesus do that? Well, Ephesians 5.25 is a great verse for husbands. Husbands, love your wives. But the second part gives why he did that, why he went through that. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Jesus experienced the greatest humility, the greatest suffering because of his love for the church. And that's what he's about to do. Jesus is about to go through the greatest humiliation by suffering and dying for people that do not deserve it. But he's about to receive the greatest glory. And he's giving them a heads up about this. He's telling them that he's about to die and he's going to leave them. And so what he's going to say, if that's true, should be taken as, a, as important, right? Like, if, I, if, if you were to have someone uh, watch your dog or watch your kids um, or your house, you'd probably have a list of like, hey, pay attention to these things, right? The most important thing you probably wouldn't put in the middle of the list or at the end, right? You would put it at the very beginning. Like, if I had a kid that was allergic to peanut butter, Um, and could die from that, I'm not going to stuff that in the middle of the, hey, pay attention to this, right? I'd be like, don't let my kid die, right? And so what is it that Jesus puts a high importance on? Verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, when, when we look at this verse, we, we, I think sometimes we get confused because we, we start applying it to everyone. But who is this one another that Jesus is talking about? Well, at this point, Judas is gone. He's not there. So it's only his disciples that are here with him. And so the one another's in this instance is his disciples. Another way of thinking about it is the church. To be clear, though, the one another are the people of God. So when I, when I reference the church, that's what I'm talking about. We are to love and serve all people. That is true. Jesus he, himself just gets done serving everyone, which we'll look at in a second, including Ju- Jesus or Judas. But there is a priority for the church. Galatians 6.10, while, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, is what it says and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. The one another is the church, the people of God. 
That is who we are to love. And Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. Now that's a little confusing because love is not a new command. And the greatest commandment Jesus has talked about it in Deuteronomy 6, 5, you are to love God. And in Leviticus 19, 8, you are to love one's neighbor. So love is not new. So what is it about this command that is new? Well, what makes this love new is that it is a love that reflects the love of Jesus. He says, the new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. See, the standard of this love is not our ability or when we feel like it. The standard of this love is Jesus himself. The distinguishable aspect of this love is that it is sacrificial love. Like, think about the life of Christ and, and just what he's gone through with all of these disciples, right? Like, yes, there's him suffering and dying for people, but like Jesus, he spent every day with these guys more than just an hour a week. He didn't just say some good things, right? He wasn't just a teacher, but he, his deeds backed up his love, suffering and dying. And Jesus did not just do small talk and call it good, but he spoke truth, calling out the Jews and even his disciples, no matter how they may have felt or the repercussions. That's the love that's being talked about here. It is not just an affection. It is sacrificial. And he says that this is the love that should be a distinguishing mark in the church. He says, by, all, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so when we come, to, we come back to First Baptist, again, there are instances where it's very obvious that this love exists. But again, People keep leaving. People keep wanting to leave. People keep considering leaving. <laughs> and, and there's multiple reasons for that. Like, this is a difficult town to live in. Jobs happen. There's not much entertainment. If you've been here for the last week, it's cold. The wind is awful, right? But one reason that should not be is because of the lack of love from this church. This is a non-negotiable aspect of the church according to Jesus. The question is, how do we love one another? It's hard to love one another. Let's be real. It's hard to love people that say that they're Christians and then sometimes don't always act like it. It's hard to love the church at times when there's different priorities or commitments or maybe you're tired. Maybe you have kids, right? Right? But again, the reality is that this is a non-negotiable command and a non-negotiable proof of Christ in you. And so how do we go around to this? Well, notice, well, you can't notice because you don't have the Greek in front of you. The word for love here is agape, which is the same word that's used in Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The reason we are able to love one another, the reason we are able to love one another when the one another is difficult, maybe not loving in return, is because the one who loved perfectly, his spirit is in you to empower you to go and love one another. He is in you to as one, First John says, to love not just in word, but also in deed. And so the first reason is because you have the Spirit of Christ. That is how this is possible. But even in John 13, there is a very clear understanding of ourselves that we need to uh, get if we are to love one another sacrificially. So Let's go ahead and back up to the beginning of the chapter. So I'm not going to read verses 1 through 4 just for time, but in those four verses, we see that this is the Passover. 
Uh, Jesus is said to have loved his disciple to the end, so he loved perfectly is what John is saying. And so they have a meal, and Jesus is about to be betrayed. Now, in Luke chapter 22, we get an idea of, of some of the discussions that are happening during this time. Okay? And the discussion from the disciples is they are arguing over who is greatest. Okay? And so there's a lot of pride going on uh, in this meal at the moment. And I, what, I, what I'm going to argue is that I think that is a root reason why we don't sacrificially love one another or serve one another. And Jesus points this out. So look, starting in verse 5, Let's read through 20. It says, Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do to you, do, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I do not speak to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. And so we, we see this really like spectacular event happening. Jesus is washing his disciples' feet. That was a job in the first century that was reserved for slaves, for those at the, in the lowest of society. Like we have shoes now. They wore sandals. Feet were disgusting back then, the things you were, you were walking in. And really, this was typically done before the meal, but Jesus is doing it in the middle of the meal. And so what's really going on is in the middle of this meal, there's this prideful argument. Who is the greatest? And the God of the universe, the one that's sitting on that throne, he does the job that's reserved for a slave. Now, Jesus, he... He says that he's doing this for, for two reasons, right? So the first reason we see is really as a symbol of what, will, of what he will do as a result from the cross. Cleanse from sin. Notice that Peter does not want Jesus to wash his feet. But what Jesus says is, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And so he's talking about what will eventually be this imputed righteousness that comes by faith from, and from being born from above, which we've talked about earlier. And that's what was, what's really key, is that this is the reason right here why we are able to love one another. It's because we have this one thing in common. So many times, that regardless, we, we have issues with people because of personalities or interests or uh, background, age, whatever it may be. But the main thing we all have in common is right here. This is what unites us, is that this cleansing has been experienced by us. We've heard and know and have received the gospel. And that should impact how we view one another as well. 
the first reason for this washing is it's symbolic of what uh, will happen. But notice that he does say that he, he goes out of his way to say that is an, an example that has been given. We've already talked about the humility of Christ, him coming down uh, as man to suffer on behalf of man. That is the greatest humiliation. And here, while the disciples are neglecting washing one another's feet before the meal, while they're discussing who is the greatest, the God King is humbling himself by serving. You see, in order to love sacrificially, yes, we need the Spirit of God in order to do that. But we also need to humble ourselves like Christ. Like, like let's be real. Sometimes we don't love one another or we don't serve one another because it's too costly. It gets into my me time. It takes away from my resources. It's too inconvenient. Or we say, no one is loving to me. Why should I love other people if people aren't loving me? Well, Paul has a lot to say on this. Paul goes so far as to say in Romans 12.10, outdo one another in showing honor. Philippians 2.3, in humility, count others more significant than yourself. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. Humility is a key com component to all of Christian life, but especially when it comes to loving one another in the church. And Jesus, he gives, he says what we're really saying whenever we refuse to love one another, and it should make us tremble. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. We can come up with a lot of reasons to not love the church. But when we do not love the church for X, Y, Z reason, what we are saying according to Jesus is that we think we are greater than Jesus. Like, it, sure, it is inconvenient to have people over. But God became man. I need my me time, or I'm tired, or, or entertainment, whatever it may be. Jesus, he lived with these dudes for three years that are arrogant and sinful, and then died for them. Not that any of those things are bad, but sometimes we prioritize those things over the ones that Christ died for. See, because our God and Savior sacrificially loved the church, we sacrificially love as well. Like again, we have the spirit of Christ in us to empower us. We have the example from Christ himself. It may not be reciprocated from the church when we're obedient in this way, but even that reflects Christ. Like do we always perfectly reciprocate our love to Jesus throughout the week when he showed the greatest love towards us? No. No but it is evidence of Christ in us. Because our God and Savior sacrificially loved the church, we also love one another sacrificially. Now, even that might seem a little abstract. Uh, it seems like whenever there's talk about loving one another or loving the church, that, that's usually the takeaway is like, I still don't get it. What does that look like? Um, so I do want to leave with a couple of suggestions, some practical ways to love the church, not necessarily rules. Some of these are commands from God, but the reality is, is that we're, all of us, we're at different stages of life. We have different giftings. Like for example, let's say someone came in here and was in a wheelchair. It would be legalistic and unreasonable for me to say, hey, we should all go shovel snow for people, right? That's wrong. But the reality is, is that 1 John does say that our love for one another should not just be in word, but also in deed. And so with all that being said, I have five practical ways for us to love one another in this year. The first one is going to blow your mind. Pray for one another. 
James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, the focus is really on the prayer, but, but think about that for a second. Think about what we talk about to one another. The command here is to confess your sins to one another. And so many times it's, it's small talk, it's shallow, it's surface level. This right here, we're missing out on prayer when we do that. So be vulnerable to one another so that people can pray for you practically. And then go and pray for one another. That's why in your bulletin, uh, I, I stapled a, a prayer list for you. It has all of our members, it has all of our attenders on it. You don't have to pray for every single person every single day, but start praying for some daily. We even have a prayer room that you can go to that has pr prayer requests on them that you can go. Go, go and, and do this too. But the first practical thing is that you can pray for one another. The second thing is serve one another. Galatians 6 2 says to bear one another's burdens. Now, talking about snow, that could mean shoveling snow for one another. But it could also mean hanging out and just being an ear to, for, to someone. To, to dumb it down even more, just to be a friend. And there's different ways to do that. But, but again, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians to encourage one another. That could mean face-to-face, -face, getting coffee, getting lunch, or whatever. I'm a millennial. There's a lot of millennials in here. We hate phone calls. Texting is fine, but we do serve one another. Next is we might need to start opening our, up our homes to one another. First Peter 4, 9 says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now, this is something that Sarah and I have struggled with. The reality is that homes in Las Vegas are small. We also have little kids. It is inconvenient to do this. But again, we arm ourselves with the same mindset as Christ. He humbled himself. And despite circumstances, despite what we have, we are to show hospitality to one another. And that includes people who have, a, I don't know, 5,000 square foot house. That also includes college students. That includes those with no kids and those, that includes those with many kids. Some of us may need to consider opening up our homes to one another. But then also, show up for one another. What I mean by that is to service, to not neglect the gathering, as it says in Hebrew, so that you can encourage one another. But also, maybe consider going to a Bible study. Get it? I get it. Everyone in here knows everything. You might not glean anything, right? And that might be the case. But the reality is there are people in here that come together that you only see for this hour or two hours every single week. And yeah, two hours out of the week, that's, that's a small sacrifice in the grand scheme of things. Show up, maybe, maybe not just so you can get something out of a Bible study, but so that you can be an encouragement to someone else. Like we, we've experienced here, there's, a, there's so much joy when there's a ton of people showing up for service. The, true is, the, the same is also true for the Bible studies. And so start showing up. And the next thing uh, I want to bring up is, is more of a concept. Um, it's, it's more from what, I, what I, uh, Sarah and I are trying to implement in our own lives that, that we got from a, a podcast. Um, it's life on life, a cliche. Um, and what I mean by this is what I hope is not the response to this is that we start adding more things to our schedule. Like, think about it. That is so unsustainable. Like a game night with 30 people, some of us, we don't have resources for that. But we can start inviting people into things that we're already doing. So for Sarah and I, I'll give an example. What we've started doing is we looked at our lives, and one thing we realized is, hey, we watch TV quite a bit. Not in a bad way. We just watch TV quite a bit. Um, and so what we've been trying to do is starting to invite people to come watch TV with us. We don't have a meal. 
We have some popcorn every once in a while. But that's what this is, so that we can know each other, love one another, know how we can pray for one another. And so when you look at your life, whether it's shopping, eating, maybe you go working out, is there some way that you can implement one another into your life? In fact, that's, that's like the perfect example of what Jesus did with his discipleship, right? Spent three years with, with these 12 dudes. Now, all these things might be exhausting. All these things are sacrificial, right? It is sacrificial to have people in, in your house. It is sacrificial to ruin kids' sleep schedules. It's sacrificial to miss out on things. But see what can happen. Verse, thir- verse 17 of chapter 13. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. The first century church experienced this. They, uh, we usually quote Acts chapter 2 for, for what the church did when they came together. It says they came together for fellowship, for the breaking of be- bread, prayer, and the apostles' teachings. And they did that day by day. But it says they were taking their meal with gladness and sincerity of heart. Imagine that as a reality for this church. People not sad or frustrated that they're stuck in Vegas. But because of our love for one another, there is gladness. There's hope. There's community. Is it work? Yes. Is it sacrificial? Yes. But is the hope, is the joy worth it? Is Christ's bride worth it? And so, yes, going into 2024, yes, let's keep making disciples. But let us also grow in this area here. Let us grow and prioritize love for one another. Christ, he's given us his greatest example of this. And we have everything we need through his spirit to see it to completion. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, I, I, I thank you um, that when your son left, um, he, he, he left us with so many things to, to walk in a, a way that pleases you and honors you. Um, thank you for your spirit who uh, convicts us of sin, but also uh, empowers us to go and, and live a life uh, uh, that is honoring and pleasing to you. Um, but also you left the church. You didn't leave us alone. You didn't leave us to, to kind of figure things out on our own or to read our Bibles by ourselves, but you, you left the church so that we can go and, and live this life with these promises of joy and, and hope and all these things. I pray for this church with, with all the members, all the attenders that, that are just gifted and, and great. Um, I pray that, that we take advantage of it while, while we can, that we enjoy one another, serve one another, and that love will be the defining characteristic of this church in 2024. Um, lead us in, in what that looks like. That, that won't look the same for every single person. But God, I pray that, that we take this seriously and that you will be glorified in it. And I pray all this in your son's name. Amen.